record. Okay, the recording. So welcome to the week, Wednesday's weekly Beginner's Guide to Funding Applications. My name's Roma and I work for Action Together uh, and the Community Wellbeing Team in Tameside. And then my co-host is uh, Michelle Lucanu, who also works for the Community Wellbeing Team in Tameside. So today's, uh, the aim of today's session is to give you a basic awareness, awareness of how to prepare your organisation for applying for funding, for looking for funding, and hopefully give you some knowledge and skills around how to write an application. Um, I'm just going to uh, turn that off. Uh, hopefully by the end of the session, we want you to be able to understand the key terms funders use. So we'll do a bit of a jargon buster and what they actually mean. Um, be able to evidence the need for a project that's really important to a lot of funders being able to say why is it that what is the need for this project uh, know how to develop the relevant outcomes outputs um, for potential projects again that's that we'll, we'll cover what those terms mean in the jargon buster and then um, a quick glance of where to where to look for funding because that sometimes that can be half the battle before anything or before even thinking about applying for funding as an organization we strongly recommend that you become funder ready and this is because all funders want to know where that the people that they're going to give the money to or the organization that they're going to give the money to can properly manage that and de deliver what it is that they've paid for to be able to have that return on investment or social return on investment. So as an organization, you really need to be in a, in a good place, in a healthy place to be able to think about or having the best chance um, at securing funding. So just using the chat box function, or if you don't want to use a chat box function, you can, you can do this at home on a piece of paper. What things do you think you'll need to have in place before even thinking about applying for funding? As an organisation, what classes you as a healthy organisation to be able to apply for funding? Whilst you're doing that, somebody's asked if um, you'll get the copy of the slides. Yes, uh, I will give the copy. I will send out the, the slideshow so you do have a copy of them, so you don't need to take too many notes. Okay, so in the chat, we've got ideas. So you need, yeah, you definitely need a project idea um, in, in, the, in the first and foremost, but you also need things like the practical stuff, like a bank account. Um, yes, it is difficult during lockdown if you've not, if you've not got one. Um, yeah, updating accounts, budgets, even further than that, I'd say, but we will go through it. Um, and then we've got, yeah, correct organisation, set up um, committee, structure, terms of reference, constitution, that kind of thing. Brilliant. Yeah, then we've got service level agreements. That's obviously when you're working in partnership. Um, brilliant. And then you've got policies and procedures. Excellent. So as I'm, I'll go through them now, but as I'm talking, if anything else comes to your mind, please use the chat box to type them in. So first and foremost, we think that the, what's most important is the governance uh, of your organisation or small um, group um, and the, having a committee to represent that group. So when we look at your constitution, it needs to have clear aims and objectives and anything that you apply for, it's good or good practice to refer back to that those clear aims and objectives. So if you're a group that works with older people and the funding um, that's available is for younger people um, think about how that can how you can utilize those funds um, for you for older people so it might be an intergenerational project for example not oh, we will work with younger people but in actual fact your your aims and objectives is to work with older people so actually it doesn't work because funders do go back and look at constitutions do do marry them up so it's important that you have that uh, knowledge beforehand when you are applying so you can marry that up yourself and that puts you in a better stead. Um, management committee, making sure that you have uh, re regular AGMs where the management committee is um, responsible, uh, sorry, members are responsible for um, the, the committee being um, employed or uh, being their representatives. Um, 
do you hold regular management committees uh, meetings and so making sure that you, you, you're catching up um, on a quarterly six monthly basis to make sure that you the projects are running on track you're still all um you're still all sort of interested in, in that role or you you're on the right lines or the, the lines that you set out to, to or the work that you set out to deliver appropriate policies and procedures definitely need to be in place and they need to be reviewed regularly obviously with code covid now it's a great time to go back and look at your policies and procedures and look at how you can change them and fit them in line with government uh, government government um guidelines um because funders will now start to look for how sort of a separate covid related policies and procedures um how active is your committee in, in, in some of the strategic work that happens at, a, at, a, at that level? So are they representatives there? Are they, do, they, do they know what, what's sort of happening um, strategically? And does your organisation have clear decision making processes? So instead of sort of ad hoc decisions on things, um, have a process which is nice and clear for everybody to be able to follow and adhere to and um, review the effectiveness of your work annually and that obviously fits in with regular meetings and attending uh, reg regular meetings agms that kind of thing um rather than you know three four years down the line totally strayed from what you originally set out to do and your work isn't having the effect that you thought it would it had four years ago then we've got staff and volunteers i'm just gonna shut my um, for those of you who haven't used Zoom before, you can use um, to, to be able to view the full screen and not have the, the, um, the thumbnails overlapping the, the work. You can just shut it down by using the, the little square on the left hand side. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do now. Staff and volunteers, uh, do you have enough staff and volunteers to be able to run the, the services that, you, that, you, that you're running? Do you have the appropriate checks, like your DBS checks in place? Um, and do you, you know, keep on top of them regularly? And I know that DBS checks are as good as the, uh, uh, on the day that you got them, um, but still making sure that those, those are in place. Um, are you informed about any legal issues that come with staff and volunteers? Have you been on any sort of volunteer management training, retention training, and um, how to look after your volunteers as well? Sometimes we forget about that, that um, volunteers do volunteers do need, um, you know, you know, well-being checks and that kind of things and uh, career uh, checks and pathways and that kind of thing. Um, managing your own finances. Um, do you generate your own income? Do you have a funding, um, a mix of funding sources coming in? And how do you record that? And how do you keep keep on top of all of that? So a good, really good, accurate um, spending uh, record or income financial record. Next one is your place and community. How well do you know your community? What is your knowledge on your community? Do you keep up to date with any changes in your community? Is the ever changing communities? Um, so how how on board and how on top of you and how um, well researched are you on your communities? Working in partnership. Now this is a really big one, uh, sort of uh, since since COVID because what what commissioners have seen over the last three months is when you take commissioning away our sector really sort of come together and work together to be able to deliver a support and, and they've proved that over the last three months. So commissioners going for, forward really want to see that, that link with other organisations, signposting into other organisations, larger organisations supporting smaller organisations and when applying for funding um, it's more favourable now to, to, to show that partnership working. Um, being involved in, in local networks, so um, an example and um, from Tameside is that we've got a Tameside and Refugee Asylum Seekers network group. Um, so anybody who works with said group, uh, it, if, if you're not really involved in, in that network, then how, how, how do you know what, what projects are, are, are needed or, or requested? Um, I mean, very good links with strategy organisations and agencies. It's it's collaborative working. Um, it's 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 not just each sector its own, and to demonstrate how we're working together with with strategy organisations. Um, clear target audience and who the services are aimed at as well. Again, that comes down to your constitution, making sure that you know who it is that you're actually um, working with and the resources that you've got that you can specifically target that that group of people. 
um, and do service service users actually know about your service so how do you market market it um, uh, you know how how what sort of um, community events do you go to, to to be able to promote your services um, if you're not well known in the community then you're less likely to be to be funded and then we've got monitoring and evaluation we're not going to touch on monitoring and evaluation too much in this session because we do have another training session that you can access which is all about um, monitoring and evaluation impact but we will ever so slightly touch on it so monitoring and evaluation it's just as important as everything else um, and it, it's something that it before looking looking for funding or applying for funding it's good to have a good robust monitoring and evaluation process in place um, do you have agreed priorities that you work towards and how well do you monitor them and evaluate them um, do you uh, regularly report on your progress, uh, not for funders, but for your organisation and your committee members itself, and making sure that you record any important data. And sometimes, I know it, it, it's, it can be difficult, but just so those quotes that you might get on a, on a daily basis, somebody that you're working with might make one quote, it's important to get all of that written down, and that then becomes your portfolio and evidence that you are monitoring and evaluating your work. Um, and then do you have the systems to review your service um, where partners and service users can feed back? So, you know, things can, it can be things like sending out a survey to partners and clients um, regularly to get that feedback to see if you're on the, uh, see if you're on the right track and if there's anything that you can improve. So the next activity that we're going to do, it's a little, it's, it's more interactive. It was, hopefully it's not me just talking to you. It's the Funder Jargon Buster. And what we'd like you to do is use the chat box to, um, so I'll bring the slide up actually, to, so on the, on the left hand side, we've got the, uh, the terms and on the right hand side of the screen in the pink, we've got the definition. So we want you to have a go at matching up the terms to the definition you can use a chat box or you can do this at home so what i'll give you 30 seconds or so for aims so you don't have to write it out what i've done is i've put numbers net on, on the pink definition i've put the number so you can just put the number in as to what you think the aim definition is Objectives. Which definition do you think objectives? Outputs. Targets. Smart. And last but not least, definitely not least, uh, outcomes. Okay. So aims is number four. So the changes that you are trying to achieve. So it's the broader sort of a broader sense of what you're trying to achieve, the overall. Sometimes it can get a little bit um there can be a bit of a crossover with aims and objectives but then your objectives are the planned practical activities that you'll carry out to bring about the changes you're trying to achieve so uh, if you think back to the slide that i showed about our aims and objectives our aims was one aim 
and then the objectives were broken down into small small bits so our objectives are usually the how you're going to to do the practical activities that you're going to do to be able to achieve that aim and we've got outputs which is the product activities services delivered to members and ben beneficiaries so it, ma the majority of the time it is very much um sort of your, your quantitative uh uh, measures but it doesn't have to be it can also be qualitative measures um, and we've got targets is what you aim to achieve in terms of the level and quality of your output and outcomes uh, targets is something that I, I, well I haven't seen uh, in in application forms used as as much as it used to be because it's been replaced with sort of your outputs outcomes breaking it down a little bit more and um, but nonetheless you may see that that and that's what that means smart um it's smart is a principle and you may see you may have heard smart you may have seen it seen it in application but it's it stands for or the acronym is specific measurable achievable realistic and timely you may see them in different sort of forms um but relatively this is it, it this is sort of it's a principle that makes you think about when you're when you're proposing a service and you're writing um you want to you you're writing out what you what your project's going to achieve then the the goals if they're smart then they're easier to um for the funders to sort of look at and think yes that's easy to achieve or um it's it's they'll be able to achieve that quite quite easily because it's a smart goal or it's a smart target if that makes sense and then outcomes is the changes or benefits or the difference can i just move my screen because i can't see uh, difference that happens for the user as a result of the organization or project's activities so we will be looking closer shortly into some of those terms and what they actually really mean practically. So the next set and, uh, is, is uh, of the jargon around sort of finances. So if you have a go at looking at budget and what you think budget, which number budget is. Income. Expenditure. Capital. Revenue. And in kind. I hope I've given you enough time. If if you feel I'm not giving you enough time, please um, just raise your hand to uh, on the on the chat or type it into the chat, and I'll and I'll slow down. Um, so budget. So we've got a detailed breakdown of how much everything will cost, and this includes the income and expenditures with evidence of costings based on quotes. So when you're asked to do a budget breakdown, it's really important that you include, as you can see, everything in there, income and expenditure, and also include quotes. Um, they want to see that you've done your research and you've, you've, you've tried to utilize the money and make, and you know, get the most out of the money. Income is all the money that comes into your organization. Um, it's good to keep an income and expenditures sheet um, and attach that to uh, your um, funding application so they can see exactly what your finances look like. Uh, expenditures, it's all the cost involved in running your projects and everything that you spend, so everything that goes out of your accounts. Capital, um, 
is the cost of large one-off items that have more than one year's useful life and can be sold in the future. So the examples there we've given is things like laptops, PCs, um, land, furniture, equipment. Um, yeah, I think that's captured most of it. Um, yeah, buildings, if you've ever applied for that. Revenue is the running of running costs of your projects or, or organization on a day-to-day -day basis so you pretty much uh, the, another one that you might see there it, that's used in our sector is core costs so revenue core costs um, and in kind is contribution towards project costs and we've put their volunteer time it's not just about the money that comes into your organization it's also about the volunteer um, volunteers also come with a price so making sure that you've costed up how uh, the number of hours of volunteer ta uh, volunteer support that you have and base that on um how much monetary value that is so um per hour i think it's about 11 pound nine um don't quote me on that it may have changed but uh, around about 11 pound uh, per hour uh, per volunteer so it's really important that you do get that in there as well And even if it's not somebody who's a volunteer, it might be somebody who just bobs in and out of your organization now and again, also record that time and record their efforts too. So the next one is, um, I'll, I'll let you have a read and have a go, but I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of go through them quite quickly for time purposes. Um, so a project is a temporary activity with a start date specific goals, activities, conditions, defined responsibilities, a budget and an end date. So when you're writing an application, it, when they ask you, describe your project, yeah, we do need a few lines in there about what your organization does, but it's important that you focus and keep that focus on the actual project that you're gonna be delivering because that is what funders are going to be investing in at a small scale, because we're obviously looking at small um, pots of funding, so it's uh, likely it's going to be a project cost. Guidelines is an explanation of what the funder will fund. Oh no, sorry, skip there. Funders criteria. Um, it's an explanation of what the funder will fund. It's really important, and we will keep reiterating this throughout because it is so important that you really understand what it is the funders will fund okay there's so many uh, um funding applications that have come through um to the the tame side well-being investments that haven't met our criteria and it's clear that they've not read the criteria so it's really important that you do read it's it's good for your credibility going forward as well um guidelines a document which sets out the aims of the fund and how to apply again the number of applications that come through which, where it's clear that they've not read the guidelines it's really important that you read the guidelines you read the fine print and you really understand what the funders are asking for um, and it, it really helps as well it's it, it it can really help you when you're writing your application to actually read that and understand and pick out you know be clever pick out some of the terminology that they may have used some of those keywords that you might see in the guidelines that you could use in your application which would make you more favorable Constitution, um, a, a lot of funders do ask for constitution, particularly up to, uh, up to £10,000, well, up to £10,000 and over, sorry, up to £1,000 and over will ask for a constitution. They want to see that your group's governed well. So uh, a constitution is a set of agreed rules governing how an organisation will be run, its membership and how Sorry, that's a typo there. So how your organisation will be run and its membership. The eligibility. Under the funders rule, the definition of who can and cannot apply and what you can apply for. Uh, there's reasons why there are eligibility criteria. Um, and a lot of the times it's because of where the funding's come from. It's not the organisations that's hosting the funding. It can be actually this is where the funding's come from. It's a public fund. So this is what the public, public expect from that fund and um, so that's the reason why we have eligibility criteria um, and the evidence of need is the information such as facts statistics and um, 
to show why your project should be funded and we will go into more depth on that a little bit later on. Uh, the last slide on jargon, again I'll give you a couple of seconds to read it but then I'll, I'll go through them myself. Okay, so milestones. Key events or stages in a project to show how the project is making progress to meet its aim. It's important that you, you, you do do milestones in your, in your um, sort of monitoring evaluation process. Um, key dates to keep on top of um, the, the project. It helps you to understand is it working, is it not, rather than getting to the end and realising, oh, it's not worked, and then having to share a piece of work with your funders that, that hasn't worked. And we've got monitoring, the regular collection of information to show a project is on track to meet its outputs. So this is things, again, it's quite, quite can be quite quantitative. So your retention registers, how many sessions have happened, how many of this have been sent out. Um, and your evaluation is about uh, making a judgment about the value or the success of the, of a project. Um, and usually here you'll find out what the outcomes have been whether the outcomes have been achieved and how well has it all gone really really important that evaluation is carried out on all activities that you do whether it's funded or whether it's just a piece of work it's really good to keep on on top of whether it's worked or not sustainability now this is an important one um, you probably won't see it as much below 10,000 but certainly above 10,000 sustainability keeping your project or group going after the funding has finished so think about, okay, it's great that we've got this funding and we've delivered this, but how can we keep this going? What, what can we put in place now to keep, our, keep this project going so we don't need to take it away in six months' time? Um, and that might be um, looking at your business plan to see how you can make yourself more attractive and, and get yourself into a position to apply for bigger funds, fundraising, that kind of thing, you know, and even contracts from, from statutory organisations. So small pots of funding, this is just sort of reiterating what we've talked about before, about what you need to be to be funder ready. Um, this training is, I should have said at the beginning, but this training is, is focused on um, small pots and what we class as a small pot of funding is up to £10,000. So it's getting yourself ready for a pot of up to £10,000. Um, if you're looking for £10,000 and above, um, then we, uh, we don't really have that information here around which, which funders to apply for um, because you, 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 know, you could possibly be looking at contracts with statutory organisations, which is a different ball game in itself. So just have that in mind when, when, when we're going through the information. Um, so some of the basic things is making sure, we went through quite an extensive list before, so these are the sort of basic um, things that you, you should have to apply for up to £10,000. So uh, a community group must consist of at least three people um, with a set of rules, so your constitution or a terms of reference and a bank account. Import, oh, sorry, I've just skipped a slide. Um, and a bank account. Um, if you've been in existence for more than 12 months, you need to have a set of accounts. It's important that you've got that income expenditure, even if it doesn't have to be a fancy spreadsheet or a fancy uh, software, it can be, you know, something that is handwritten in, in, a, in a book. Okay, but as long as it's there, it's important that, you, that, that you've got that evidenced. Um, if you're a brand new group, you need to have a cash flow forecast. It shows that you're thinking ahead of, of what you're gonna be doing with finances going forward. Uh, you need to plan, uh, you'll have a plan of your project, um, who is it for, what you'll be delivering, um, where it's going to be delivering and why it's needed, so that evidence, um, and what evidence do you have to show that this project is needed. There's a lot of funders out there that are quite hot on that, especially the big lottery, and um, they want to see uh, how do you know that this is needed, and they want to see that evidence. Most groups will have, need to have insurance if you're doing specific things. Um, so if it's an exercise group, it's, you'll need public liability insurance, um, unless, it's done through a, the, uh, unless it's done through a venue and then you're using the venue's insurance. Um, and that's especially if you're working with, with members of the public and the local community. Some of the key terminology um, for uh, when you write an application or for projects that you will see um, is aims, objectives, outputs and outcomes and inputs. 
So aims and object, uh, uh, sorry, aims, um, it's your organizational goals. I know we talked about it a little, uh, a little bit before, so I'm not gonna talk through this slide, but just to highlight that they do often start with the word to, and then the sort of words that they'd like to see when you're talking about aims is to improve, increase, enhance, or reduce, decrease. So to have aims that sort of start with that, it shows that you, you've, you're aiming to do something or you've got a goal to do something. Um, don't worry about the bottom bit there. Objectives, it's to, again, as we mentioned before, it's, it's more precise. It's, it's, a, it's a breakdown of what you're going to do, how you're going to um, achieve the aim. And the words, the key words for that is words like provide, organize, offer, and run. So in, uh, some, oh, sorry, these are examples, aren't they? So redu uh, recruit, um, 30 participants, run, three sessions, teach, use, introduce, contemporary. So as you can see that the, in the examples, how to sort of use those words. And then we've got input. Um, so these are the resources that you need to, the, the resources that you need to put in to get your project to, to be able to deliver your project or carry out an activity. And these might be things like the money, time, staff, expertise, um, equipment, that kind of thing. Um, it can be financial, but it also can be, as we mentioned before, volunteer, staff time, that kind of thing. Um, oh dear. Outputs are the tangible projects or measurable, uh, uh, measurable products or services. So 30 participants attended a session, the number of um, things that were made, um, the number of events that were held, the number of people who um, managed to get a certificate or uh, yeah, that kind of thing. So as you can see, it's very uh, number measurable. Outcomes, the changes that you have caused due to your project. And these are very much your qualitative um, measures. Um, so participants have a greater knowledge, uh, participants are feeling more confident, they've got more com uh, self-esteem, they've reported uh, feeling more motivated, they've increased their understanding or knowledge. And as you can see, we're going to have a five minute break because we are on 10.57. So um, quick brew break for everybody. Um, if you can get back for 11 oh two and i'm being quite precise there but that'll be great because we've got quite a bit to get through thank you thank you thank you i'm recording so welcome back so we're just going to focus on those words that, as we mentioned before the break, which is the inputs, outcomes, out, uh, outputs, inputs, outputs, outcomes, and monitoring and evaluation. Um, and this is this is a making a cup of tea sort of analogy of of trying to break down what they really mean, and then afterwards we'll put it into a real project um, example. So when you make a cup of tea, the inputs would be your sugar, your tea, your tea bag, your milks, your milk. Okay, and then the organizational process would be where those inputs are then all mixed together so they may be different depending on which organization you're from so in a cup of tea sense of uh, in a cup of tea terms you may put the water in before the tea bag you might put the, the water on the tea bag you may put the sugar in before with the tea bag absolutely that is your process of how you make a cup of tea feel free to use a chat box to argue about which is the right way that's absolutely fine but everybody has a different way of wanting to make the end result. The output of, the, of mixing the input with your organizational process is that there's an output. So a service has been delivered and a number of people have accessed a service. So at the end of this cup of tea, uh, at, at the end of mixing your sugar, your milk, your tea, um, you've got a cup of tea, okay? And the outcomes of that, of making a cup of tea, is you have one refreshed person. Um, but how do we know that that person has 
is refreshed. So this is where the monitoring and evaluation comes in. So we would ask the person, how did you like your brew? Was it nice? Was there enough, was there enough uh, sugar in it? And it's only when you start asking, do you find out actually, yeah, your brew was cold or you didn't put enough sugar in it or too much milk, whatever the case may be. And then, then you can then go back and then change your organizational processes here. So next time we're going to heat the water up a little bit more or we won't put as much sugar in. And then you'll do that process again. You'll change those organisational process to make sure that the outcomes have been met. OK, it may mean that sometimes you need to change the import because you know what? They don't they don't drink. They don't drink normal tea. They drink Earl Grey. So therefore, you're going to change the, the flavour of your tea bag. So it's the import. It's what you're putting in that may have to change. OK, so when you think about those terms and what they actually mean in a simple way, it can help you try implement it when, when you're thinking about your project. So the activity, um, we've got a, 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 an example of a service here or a group and a service that they offer. And we're going to look at those keywords, the inputs, the outputs and so forth. Um, so the project is it's moving forward. It's a tenants and residents group. It's a constituted group and they support their members to find employment and the group is made up of, of volunteers. They'd like to run a one-to-one -one digital training program for residents to teach them new skills and improve their employ employability. At the moment, we don't recommend any one-to-one -one digital face-to-face -face training, obviously, um, but this is obviously pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID when, when we go back to our new normal. Um, when we... Uh, when we're thinking about, say, the input, for example, I'd like you to think about going forward and what, how this can be affected by COVID and what things that you need to put in place for, you know, once we go back into our new normal, um, because we'd still have those, those government guidelines to follow. So just have a think about that as well. So input, what kind of things do you think uh, uh, this group, this example, would need to input into their activity or project again use the chat or you can do it at home totally up to you okay did that a bit too quick but i was trying to do something else some good answers on the chat box we got yeah. resources expertise venue laptops again stationary yes it's very important to have stationary volunteers equipment those are good examples on there volunteers readiness yeah brilliant yeah uh, somebody said something about yes Earl Grey tea is the way forward that was me <laughs> that was you yes gonna say definitely um yep so all of the things that you said on there great that's brilliant um blog on the digital broadcast brilliant yep yeah. so you may have covered it but i'll just quickly go through so an accessible venue accessible for all um and a how-to guide so thinking about covid maybe you know having uh, the actual literature printout available for people to to be able to work at home if you can't meet up um the relevant stationery so all those little things that you might not think about that, that you need um utilities is, is it going if you're at a venue is it going to be the venues um utilities that you're using or do you need to get your own uh, connection equipment contract marketing and promotion um link with employers as well so you, you would need those relationships um with employers to get that information or monitoring or evaluation information afterwards to know that actually what is it that you as an employer need um so you can work together what is it that you want to see what is it that you need and then you can get that information off them how many people have gone into employment in it with this employer um and then obviously the stuff that you said before about volunteers laptops pcs that kind of thing the more practical stuff um let me just show you. i've got quite a few screens open here okay the next one outputs but 30 seconds or so to think about some of those outputs and put them in the chat. Brilliant. 
Okay. okay. Motivated stuff is one output. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Right home stuff. Yes. Understanding awareness. Okay. So some of those answers there are really around what your organisation. Some of the outputs can be what your beneficiaries or your your client group um, get out of the session. So you've got the number of people who. Um, just shut my screen again. Number of people who got into employment, um, the number of people who learn a new skill, number of courses that you've delivered, the number of beneficiaries attending the programme, and the number of certificates that you may have handed out. Um, and to be honest, the, the things that are in the chat is stuff that I've missed off that I didn't really think about. So thank you for, for those who have put stuff like the understanding and awareness, um, understanding cultural differences. That's really yeah, well-informed staff, stuff like that, that I didn't actually think about that you guys have put. So thank you. Um, and then the outcomes. What did the outcomes look like for that project? Okay, so here's just a few. Let me just see what the weapons written in the chat. Increase, yeah, end product. Yep, yeah, so these are some of the words that you that you can use for um, outcomes. So increased self self-confidence, self sorry, confidence, self-esteem, but also improved physical health. Um, I know that a, a from some of the work that we've done in, in tame side with community wellbeing investments what, what the groups have done and um, they've actually improved people's physical helps and, and um physical health and um reliance on medication and and gps um increase in skills uh increased feelings of happiness and value increased motivation determination these are the things that you guys have already said increase in further education opp opportunities so they've gone from working with you um up to you know to go on to a level one or two and re uh, reduce social isolation through the sessions we got a few nice examples in the chat box as well uh, increased role model for young young ones it says brilliant yeah Being understood and accepted that's a nice outcome mm -hmm. awaiting of the minds that's an interesting one yeah Reduce unemployed tenants. So there's some really good examples in the chat box as well. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I think one that we missed out, and I've missed out as well, actually, is the employers. Employers are being mm -hmm. as well because they'll have a sense of um, you know, they'll have some learning there and, and things that they can put into place. Monitoring and evaluation. What kind of things? you see or expect yeah, so how would you monitor and evaluate that project yeah what, what what kind of things might you see or expect when it comes to monitor and evaluation in relation to that that project how can you do it impact evaluations feedback post training survey that's good mm -hmm. record testimonies positive outcomes so what did you say about the money recording testimonies oh recording testimonies yes the money. <laughs> money is also good <laughs> regular meetings with volunteers that's a good one case studies are excellent pictures are also a great way to have visual um, examples of monitoring and evaluation well okay so really good examples um, there. Really, really, yeah, really good. So I've just put a few more there. So how relevant um, was the was the activity? How successful it was? How, what can you do to improve? Um, how can you prove you as an organisation? So it's not just about the project and the beneficiaries. How can you as an organisation also improve based on what you've what, what you've just delivered? Um, 
has it identified any further needs within the community community so not all outcomes are positive it's actually highlighted that you know what this group of people are totally excluded so we need to now work with this with this group um, could could uh, could lead to changes in your inputs and changes in your process so be prepared as an organization for those um, the tools and indicators it's, it's important that when you're writing a funding application that you think about the tools and indicators of your outcomes and how you're going to monitor so it's great saying we're going to um, monitor the amount, number of people who come through the door for example how are you going to do that the indicator or the tool would be through a register or through a signing in system yeah because your funders might want to see that afterwards so it's important that you write down exactly how you're going to measure those outputs and outcomes um, are the appropriate so if you're working with um, a group that english isn't the first language or a group of people with learning disabilities then make sure that you've adapted your tools and indicators to suit that that client group so evidence in the need it's something that we mentioned uh, pre-break it's really important that you do evidence your project and it's not just an idea that you thought of you know in the pub on the back of a fag packet it's something that is actually um it's it's needed and it's relevant to your local um community or local area and it fits in with st uh, strategies within your local area as well so this evidence it could be statistics it could be pop population data um Screen, sorry. Um, breakdown of your local area in terms of ethnicity. So getting all of those sort of um, differences and making sure that your project meets and fits around those that that those statistics of your area. Research. So it may be research about a, a particular a particular project. Um, so it could be a uh, lack of uh, local facilities, for example, there on, on the slide um, or services in your area. You might not have a specific serv service in that area. So therefore, that's why you're going to put, put that on and research also about um, what your project has. Uh, if um, so, I don't know, if, for example, a coffee morning, uh, a coffee morning has been proven to reduce social isolation. So, you know, pick out research like that as well sometimes you don't need to put it in an application especially for up to ten thousand pounds but it's good to have that in your background in case they start digging further and asking you at a later date well how did you know then you, you know you've got that information and it's good for yourself as an organization as well to have that um, local regional national strategies and needs analysis we'll touch on this later on and because um this session is very much for and obviously from the introduction you'll know that we're all from the different localities across greater manchester i think we've even got somebody from shrewsbury haven't we um that, that we, we haven't really gone into any um where to find the national strategies and where to look for this information uh, so if you want to use the chat box to share any information that you know about um your local JSNA or your local um, st uh, strategic priorities, anything like that, then please use the chat box to share that amongst yourselves um, so people can go away and find that information. But what we mean by that is really go away and have a look at what your area's um, priorities are. So for, for Tameside, for example, it will be looking at you know, my life in Tameside, which is the equivalent of the, the other areas as JSNAs, so you joint um, don't strategic needs assessment so go and have a look at them and see what what's um what they're saying basically engagement and consultation and this one's just as important as all the other you know strategies and um research and that kind of stuff it's engaging with the actual public and again big a very big lottery national lottery are very big on this one and i envisage other funders are as well they want to see how why how is your work or your project idea endorsed by the community? Um, so gather that information, gather that evidence, surveys, questionnaires, obviously I've put on there, telephone, online post at the moment because of COVID, um, focus groups, you can run them as we are now on Zoom, um, but obviously once we're out of, out of COVID and guidelines permits us to, you can have informal discussions, consultation events and get those quotes. So we've just put a quote there, that quote there from um, 
somebody who's from home start berry is a lot is more powerful than statistics okay it really brings it to life to the funders so it's really important that you that, that you capture some of that information it's not just we're going to put this project on it's we've consulted with um x amount of people from this community who have informed us and here's some quotes okay some of the priorities as well when you're writing your um, application is to think about gaps in service provision there's no point in putting um a session on um so, so for the example here i don't need to think of one um sorry so the example here teenage pregnancy rates are a problem in your area have that as your your project idea if you work with with young people um rather than something else so rather than you know something around physical activity really focus on what the, what the gaps are and you're only going to know that if you if you do tap into your jsnas your my life in tame side your strategic information going out there talking to people going out there making those links with partners and statutory organizations this is where you're going to get that information from duplication of services know your community know the groups in your area as we mentioned before is it going forward it, Mission is all going to be around sort of partnership working so um, if, if a partner organization is already delivering that there's no point in putting another one on um, see how you can actually work together <clears throat> uh, and partners and collaborations I've just touched on that very good working relationship with with um, with the other groups in your areas um, fund, joint funding bids is, is is really a step in the right direction I'd say in, in this current climate um, and using those community resources rather than applying for, for money for um, for something it's good to demonstrate that you've the reason you're working in partnership is because we can amalgamate our resources and we can pick, we can use this from this resource and we can use this from this partner and, and that from another partner um, okay. uh, so preparing to write your funding uh, your your bid uh, these are some sort of uh, things to really think about um, when you're before you you actually apply. So we have we have touched on these before, but I will reiterate because they are important points. So your funding criteria: read the eligibility criteria um, or the guidelines um, very carefully, and really have a look at what they do and don't fund. Um, so an example of this is for uh, to apply for funds over a thousand pounds for action together, the community wellbeing investments, um, or the community response um, funds that have just been um, that we're sort of wrapping up at the moment. Uh, you need to be a member. So we've had so many app applications of people who aren't members, and it's just really just reading the application. It just it saves so much time either either side as well to really read the application, the, the guidelines. Sorry. Um, and make sure that you meet the funders criteria criteria and priorities a lot of the time people go in with their own agenda it's not just about your own agenda it's about what the funders want as well and what they've identified and what their priorities are so your application will really need to link with those priorities sometimes the priorities are really broad which can be quite positive negative and positive but the positives are is that you you can really shape your project to meet those wide priorities but sometimes those priorities can be really sort of um, focused so if you feel that you're going to struggle to really meet that priority then then I wouldn't, wouldn't waste your time go and find another fund that that matches your idea um, writing with purpose so really think before you write read the criteria again read it again have a really clear understanding of your own project it's not just made up as you're going along really understand what it is that you're going to be delivering um, and what's going to come out of it and how you're going to monitor it and how you're going to execute it uh, it needs to be a robust idea and that word robust is really important because a funder can identify a robust project idea from a from a uh, somebody's thoughts of just needing to get funding so we'll, we'll put this in if that makes sense Think the budget budget's really important to spend some time and really think about what it is that you want you need to be really specific about what you want um, and the more specific you can be the better sometimes they may not stipulate that in, in the form but for yourself it's good to be as specific as you possibly can with all the funds um, and as we mentioned before quotes as well grabbing a few quotes and um, which shows that you are really thinking about making the 
it cost effective. Um, details give confidence, so spend time. Yeah, so really think about what what um, the money that you um, that you require, and only really ask for what you need. Um, don't ask for, don't sort of overestimate or underestimate, and um, because then this can really sort of backfire on you. Um, so an example of that would be if you've um, asked for. If, if it's a scout project and you're going to take children on a on a residential um but in your application you've asked for a laptop then that can really sort of backfire on backfire on you and and, can, and there has been times where funders have rejected the application based on that so the actual writing of your application so the content summary these are some of the things that you will find in applications um so we'll we'll quickly go through um them because there is quite a lot of writing in this, so um, we'll, we'll quickly talk through these. So you're gonna, there's going to be a profile summary, um, and in this you need to offer a, a simple introduction of what your organisations do, who you are, um, a little bit about your uh, governance, so whether your your status, whether you're a charity, constituted group, um, and where you operate, and and who your what your sort of aims and objectives um, are. Um, there's something else I was going to say about this, but it's literally just slipped my mind, but I think it will come back to me. Oh, yeah, that's it. So sometimes a lot of people can put in a links to their website rather than writing it. They can say, find out more here on our website. Funders won't have a look at your website. They don't have, really have time to look at websites and things like that. Um, or, um, yeah, so, so don't really bother putting in uh, links, really explain it through the application. Project summary, a summary of the project and any activities that you're thinking of delivering. And the need for the project, again, as we are reiterating this again, describe why the project is needed and who will benefit. Really be specific, specific about who's going to benefit because it will come, to, come up in the manage, monitoring and evaluation anyway afterwards. So use this as an opportunity to tell them who's going to be the beneficiaries. The outcomes describe all the changes and effects that will happen as a result of your work. Um, and again, the sort of research will come into this bit as well. How do you know that this is going to be an outcome? Monitoring and evaluation, describe how you're going to collect the information. And remember the word indicators, so what you're going to use to collect that information and how you're going to track that progress. Um, and also describe how you will continue to review the project and there may be changes necessary necessary as you go along depending on what comes out of monitoring and evaluation project management describe how the project is going to be managed um, who's going to be there to manage it obviously you don't need to use names but what roles and who's going to be responsible for it as well and the financial summary it's, this is a breakdown of all the costs um with the run uh, with the running of the project and why you do need that that money for that specific item um, and link it with the project idea. So as I used the example before about the scouts group, the scouts group were, were taking children on a residential, they asked for a laptop, they didn't get, they didn't get the funds. Um, if they, ha they did actually need that laptop because um, they wanted the children to then come back and upload their pictures and write summaries of, of their experiences of going on this residential, had they put that in their project, um, in their content summary or in their it summary they would have got the funds but because they didn't the funders couldn't make that link so it's important that you link it with the project idea and outline how you meet the funders eligibility criteria as well uh, a quick really quick tips for your content again is stuff that we've talked about but think of a punchy and positive title for your project that always um Remember, when you're reading through an application, if you're reading sort of very formal words, it can get a little bit boring. Um, so try and um, sort of make it as interesting as you poss possibly can. So Bangla Beats, that's just an example. Um, refer to your own uh, governing documents when introducing your aims and objectives. And because remember, they will look at uh, the aims and objectives of the project that you're applying for or proposing and your government, uh, your uh, constitution aims and objectives, they will make that link. 
building your credibility, try to include any evidence that demonstrates uh, how you can run projects, your track record, build your portfolio, remember monitoring and evaluation, even if you've not got funding for that, for that project, you're delivering it off, the, off your own back, still collate that monitoring information because it comes to use for, for future funds. Um, and highlight some of those major successes, but also highlight some of the learning along the way as well. Be specific about the problem, really sort of show that, and this is where that evidence and the need comes in, show that you um, are addressing that need and using the local research and statistics, um, name dropping some people might call it. Um, be specific about what you will do and how you'll do it. Um, so many applications that, that I've read that it's really difficult to actually understand what it is that they're going to actually do. So we then have to go back to them and, and say, what it is, what is it that you're actually going to do? If, you, if it helps to write your application in bullet points, do that. Um, just so we know exactly what it is that you're going to deliver, how many people you're going to be delivering to, where you're going to be delivering it, who's going to be delivering it. And then, as we mentioned before, link the project as closely as you can to the funder's priorities. Sometimes we can get involved in our own or run away with our own agendas. It's really important that we meet the, the priorities of the funder. And if you feel that you, that you, you can't, if you're really um, sort of um, clutching at straws, then it's probably not the best funds for you to apply for. And here's a list of where you can go to look for funding. Um, these are obviously websites that you can you can visit. A couple of them, I think, are you have to pay for if you want, and, and then a few you get sort of a basic um, funding search, and then you may to get an advanced funding search, you may have to pay. Um, I particularly know that this one here is is one that you have to pay for, um, but it's definitely worth just visiting them um, to find out what's available out there. And that's how I certainly look for, for different funds because they all have different, they, they, a lot of them have similar stuff or the same, so, sorry, the same um, funds, but, but when you look through them, you might find the odd one here and there that, that they've not, that the other funder, the other page hasn't um, picked up on. So really sort of make sure, don't just stick to one, just have a look at them all. You will get the slides by the way, so you don't have to write these addresses down, you'll get the slides to, um afterwards um this one's a good one my community.org i think there's quite a lot of variety of funds on this one um and the charity excellence is very much where you have to set up your own portfolio and then once you've set up it, it, it's, it's quite a good um not just for searching for funding but as an organization just keeping on top of top of yourself uh, making sure that you've got the right policies and, and procedures and stuff like that in place so it's almost like a bit of an organizational health check system that you can use that is free um, to use and then you'll go on to look for funding as well from there um, your local cvs so um for those who are in rochdale oldham and tameside please um come to us and uh, visit our website to look for the different funds that are available or contact us. Um, I didn't put the contact details on the screen um, on the slideshow, but I will, before, when I send it out, I will send it out with the, with the contact details um, for each area. And another thing that I do as well is just not just focus on our areas, go to other uh, CVS websites as well. Uh, whether it's Leeds, York, they, Mac, they, all the different CVSs have different funds on there as well. Um, so visit their websites. And I've put their funding bulletin. So please use the funding bulletin. It's a 10GM funding bulletin. So it's, it's, it's all of the, the 10GM areas working together to put, this to, to put this out there. So it covers all of the, the GM, 10GM areas and funds that are available for those. Um, please use that. You can find that on our website, which is this page here, and that's the the link there at the bottom for our um, funding page. Just check the time. Brilliant. So, so any questions? Um, so we have two questions on the chat box at the moment. Okay. One of them is by Alona Tucker. Do you have any tips for online applications? 
for example, copy and paste the question onto a Word document because she finds the long application can time out. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so there are a few funders out there that have it where you, where you have to sort of apply straight away and you can't go back it, it back in and out. Um, the, the, I think the best thing to do is, is if you know what your project idea is already and you have all of that written out and you have your uh, documents available so some of those documents that we talked about your constitution your financial accounts already available then it's easier then to just have that and then upload it as you as you go along but if you've already got if you looked at the, the content summary um pages i'll just go back uh, yeah so these pay, uh, if you've got if you can uh, go away and have this information written for each of your projects then you've pretty much much got it covered and you can just type that into into the um, into the online application. Does that make sense? And then sometimes you need to tweak it as well, depending on who the funder is, because it's not always a copy and paste job. So you will have your content summary ready. So you, you know your organization and your project, but depending on the criteria of the funder, you might have to tweak it so it fits with their priorities as well. Yeah. So that's why it's important that you do read the guidance and funding criteria before <laughs> to know that your project is going to fit in with that. And if there's any work that you need to do prior to starting the online application to make it sort of tweak it to fit into the, uh, uh, into the um, funding criteria. So, that, that's why it's important to read read that read them beforehand so you know what it is that you're actually applying for and you know what they're going to be asking you and you know how how your project is going to fit in with the funding criteria priorities and eligibility as well does that make does that make sense for whoever wrote that do you want to do a thumbs up to to know that i've answered it yes she says thank you so i think we have managed to answer yes. that one brilliant okay if if, if if i haven't then just just raise your hand and, and let us know so we can have a bit more of a discussion about it. Okay, so it's a question from Sue and Clive. Can you apply for funding before current funding runs out? Maybe you want to unmute yourself and explain that question a bit more, Sue and Clive. Yeah, it's just that we've um, we got the Community Wellbeing Grant, um, which I think should run out around about September. Uh, but depending on what's happening with, with the coronavirus and everything like that, I don't know whether that will, uh, the time will be extended. But if there was something else that we wanted to do um, and there was an opportunity for, for, fun, for more funding, would we be able to apply before the one that runs out in September, if, if you know what I mean? Yeah, so um, you can, um, they, they may ask you, some funders do ask, is this, is this a continuation project? And you'll just be as honest as you possibly can and say, yes, we've got, you know, uh, three months of worth of this funding left and, and we'll propose, as long as you show that your proposed project date is after that funds um, ran out, then that's absolutely fine. Um, there are some funders, so um, I, it, might, it might be in the National Lottery, but don't quote me on that one, where if you have applied for it, you can't apply for it for the next year. Oh, actually, I'll use Tameside for good because I know that that's the case with Tameside for good. Um, so one of the funds that was available in Tameside, um, you could apply for it, but then you weren't apply, allowed to apply for it the, in the next round. So it does depend on the funder. So again, it's important to read their criteria and their, their sort of processes and, and ways of working. But certainly, if it's a different fund, you can apply for a different fund as long as the date is after the the, the end date of the current fund yeah that's where we have a problem Roma, because ours is due to run out sometime in september and yeah we've been locked down since february we've not been using any money so mm. um where do we go from there will, will the time period be extended so that's a, a that's a sort of a, a separate one isn't it and that's one for me so I, I i did email you in regards to you know what you can do with the funders funding so for those of you who have had funding um uh, you know in the last year and it's run into sort of covid obviously all funders have their own um ways of working but a lot of funders have been quite relaxed when it's come to come to covid so certainly to uh, our community wellbeing investments we've been quite relaxed with it so we've, we've said that you can um 
extend your project um just keep hold of the money and extend it for afterwards so i just have a think about um later on what you might want to do with that with those funds or if you need to change your sessions whether you want to take it onto an online platform and you need to use the funds to set up zoom or something like that and we've already we've already done that we've yeah, already right. so, we so you could use the funds um for that but if, should we have a separate uh, chat later so in clive yeah, about, yeah. about that yeah by all means yeah yeah definitely yeah thank you brilliant and I also think if, if you haven't spent your money because of COVID, it's important to keep in contact with the funder if they haven't contacted you already, uh, because they will let you know whether you can hold the money until things open up again or whether they want the money back. So it's important to have that relationship with the fund so you know where you stand if you haven't been able to deliver your services because of uh, the restriction and lockdown. I understand. Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Definitely, yeah. Um, really important that, that that you do keep that that link and let them know because all funders they're all in the same position this is all, all new to everybody at, at the moment so we're all finding different ways of working and different ways of managing and putting things in place so it's really important that you have to think and be as honest as you possibly can with your funders you know i can't see m many funders being really stringent with with the funds at the moment um and expecting you to deliver or expecting the money back I, you know yeah to see if there's any Funders that do do that. Okay, thanks, Roman. Thanks, Roman. Got any more questions? Is there anything that you feel that I've not covered? Um, There's a, a question by Jude. Sorry, mm -hmm. how would you go about applying for that? Maybe if Nasreen, you want to uh, unmute yourself to explain that question. My apologies. Um, I was actually responding to Jude's comment about the co op funding. Um, I think my question is more of a concern, really, which I find. So, for example, I've um, a friend of mine applied for funding, and uh, it took like I think about four weeks to apply back to me. Now, I think that's one of the one of the things I find is uh, we've identified that we need a pot to keep it going until the next funding arrives. And I think as a grassroots organisation, uh, we didn't plan. Um, Changes happen so rapidly. We found we were applying for funding we were still, whilst we were waiting for the results and for the funding of the outcome. We were still providing a challenge. Now, my question is this once the uh, funding does arrive, can we then, can we then cover for the period that we think that's needed, or do we just start from the day the funding arrives and start a project from that? Okay, it did break up there um, quite a bit and it, I found it difficult to hear, but am I right in thinking that you're saying that it, it takes a long time for funders to get with a specific fund? Um, it's taken a long time for that, for that to get to you over four weeks. So in that, within that four weeks, you've needed to deliver the service. And um, to, is it okay to use the funds retrospectively? Um, okay, so a lot of funders do say to not use the funds retrospectively um they will state that that this isn't to fund activity that has happened already um unfortunately um, so i mean i suppose this is stuff that we this the feedback for um yeah i mean in terms I understand. I mean, if I was a if I was a funding provider, I under, I I completely understand that concept. But I think one of the challenges I find, and maybe you can take it back to the funders, is because yeah. of the rapid changes and the changes are, are so diverse. So one family could need, for example, a top up on their gas, electric. On top of that, they might need some mental health support. Yeah. you know so it's just a combined um it's actually very combined. So whilst we're applying for funding, which is all good and well, mm -hmm. and we're like okay from next month or when the funding arrives we can provide a befriending service we can provide some food etc 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 but it's taken so long to arrive in the interim mm -hmm. um, and we're still providing the service now in that interim who is uh who do we approach i mean yeah but for me from my personal experience i am so grateful as a muslim that we had the ramadan month and because of their zakat or uh, and their contributions and their donations we survived the covid uh, a, a huge two three four weeks with relying on people just donating to us but that mm -hmm. as soon as that dried up 
um, we were then just waiting. Um, but because intrinsically you're very passionate and you want to deliver, you can't wait for funding. You have to still carry on. And that takes you into sometimes borrowed money. And that's where I think I find, this is my personal experience, I don't know whether it's for everybody, as a grassroots organisation, I think that's where um, we are weakened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I'll be quiet now. Stand, yeah. And, you know, I, I totally take that on board and it's something that I will definitely feed back to the funders. Um, I think with the larger organisations, it's probably a little bit easier because they may have reserves um, and then they can use those reserves to, to, to help them through that, that period before the funding comes in. Um, but for smaller organisations, I totally appreciate that they don't have, they may not have um, those reserves to fall back on. Um, so that is something that I can definitely take back to, to the um, to the funders, particularly the, the sort of um, more common ones that we're seeing at the moment. Sorry, Nazreen, go I have one more question. I'm so sorry. I'm going to utilise this platform. No, it's uh, fine. So we as grassroots organisations, we're very much establishing ourselves. One of the things we've never done is a pro applied for a uh, project man management fee, for example. So if one of my coordinators is managing a, lot of a project, how much would we put down realistically as their management fee? Would you break it down to the hours that they're using, which right now that you know there is some some of them working over weekends late in the evenings because the demand is there mm -hmm. so how how would how would one go about putting a figure to that so management um fee or management cost is usually around about eight to eight to ten percent um so you, you you can break it down into into hourly a, a rate if you want but it, it, between eight and ten percent we'll say eight yeah eight to ten percent is is if you just put that then then that's sufficient okay. okay and now from that pot i mean that's the other thing i'd like to have a clear answer of how you um put down um uh, running costs so if i'm applying for a project for let's say i'm applying for three thousand pound out of that which i didn't know when i was set, starting up but i have identified now i never took into consideration uh, like the ladies uh, all of you lovely people have mentioned stationary resources time and it adds up you don't realize it in the in the in the buzz of application you don't realize it but and i think so how would you can you are you allowed to incorporate running costs in there or is the three thousand solely for the project and you have to find your running costs elsewhere some project some funders are quite specific about about that nazarene some uh, some funders uh, say that yes you, you, we're not funding um core costs or running costs um revenue we're not we're not funding that some funders are a little bit um are, do open it up to that and you can so it's about what the funders criteria really as to what they will fund and what they won't fund um fabulous i mean another feedback you can take back is because as I think as all of us as grassroots organizations and charities, I think we I certainly relied heavily on fundraising events and yeah. local organizations, local businesses who contributed. And because of the current pandemic um, and what's going on, people aren't donating. And that has really hit us. Um, that's really hit us. And people aren't talking about things like that because the people we're trying to serve, they themselves are in need of support. And we're trying to serve a need dis with discretion. Um, mm -hmm. to make sure they're still empowered and not feel uh, as though they've been you know poverty stricken and i think that's where the challenges are for true service to take place mm -hmm. okay. right okay so these are the things that i can i can sort of take back in terms of your point just before nazreen um about uh what was it point four what, what you said gosh what was it active listening and taking notes <laughs> <laughs> taking notes but i've not taken no, notes on that thinking right i'll keep that <laughs> um, I, just, I think the point we're trying to make is we, we rely on contributions and, and fundraising businesses have dried yeah. up everybody's diff it's difficult for everybody it's, it's difficult to go take a pot and say here give me some because i'm doing xyz when, they, when they're in need themselves yeah it was, yeah. it was the point just before that that you said about you asked the question and i've totally forgot the question um it'll come back to me and if okay I'll probably come back to me as i'll well. get back to you <laughs> there's, there's also a uh, a question about project coordinator i think mary's asking what the uh, average acceptance fee for a project coordinator is for a project coordinator and not management costs oh so what's the average accept acceptance fee for a project coordinator 
Um, so a, a, it depends, a project coordinator, the roles of, of it's quite varied. So it depends on what it is that your project coordinator is going to be delivering. Um, so an example of that would be a volunteer coordinator. Um, you can ha they can be based on um, around about a salary of around about fourteen thousand up to twenty up to twenty two. So it, it does actually depend on what what you mean by a project coordinator and what that role entails. Because for everybody, and I'm sure everybody on this call, a project coordinator will mean something different. Yeah. Um, based on my experience, a coordinator is is on a rate that's a little bit more than a, an officer. So a, co a coordinator, again, based on their roles, would, would probably be over the 20,000 mark. Definitely over the 20,000 mark. Wow. Can I just say wow on that? Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, quite a large figure because what, we, what we've done, I can only go off my example. So if we've got a project to run, for example, providing a befriending service online. Um, so we've got a project coordinator who manages the volunteers. I would never have thought of providing a salary going long term, even though she's been mm -hmm. volunteering with us two years. It's never something that crossed my mind. Um, but what we have been doing is uh, providing her expenses. And mm -hmm. I have come to realize that we need to grow. And I didn't, I never really think about salaries from organizations because it doesn't feel like we're serving a purpose. It feels like we're serving our own need kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah. I think that's a, an understanding where I need to maybe ask more questions I feel comfortable in, in what we're doing yeah I think that obviously that that figure there would be for a for an organization that has uh, that has um, become more established and is, is started to recruit people and has a recruitment policy and all of that in, in place um, but as I mentioned before it is very much on based on what that coordinator role will look like um, and coordinator role means different for, for everybody um, for all different organizations so yeah I can see that um, Jude has posted a link for the co-op. Is that funding, Jude? Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm a member pioneer for the co-op. Um, I, I just cover Saddleworth, but um, the co-op is, is open for funding and it's about a 3k pot of money. Um, they don't actually get that many people applying, so I'm saying please apply um, for your local area. Yeah, Jude, is is the co-op still um, where the uh, members have to uh, um, uh, vote for the activity for for that project or that that organisation? Is that still the case? Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's not the members. It's it's actually the the uh, it's the co-op that actually decides on. On who gets the, the money um, right. but the money comes from contributions from the members each member when they're when you're paying your bill um, yeah. uh, uh, five percent of that goes to you um, yeah to your cause yeah right okay okay so it's the co-op that decides it and not people don't go on the online and vote no, no they don't right. yeah I've changed it right lovely we've got seven minutes left of the session are there any more well, seven, maybe five minutes. Any more questions at all? Anything uh, from the slides that we'll be showing you that you have any burning questions that you want to ask regarding to the content? Shut my window, it's a little bit loud. Oh, we've done a good job. <laughs> right, in that case, if you, have an, if you have no specific questions that you want to ask uh, regarding the content, as we said previously, we're going to um, email the slides to the participants and we're also going to upload the, this recording. I'm going to stop recording soon. We're going to upload this. Actually, I'll start recording now. I'll pause it.